You may not uh, uh, recognize me, but I'm more known for my other job, which is with Pacific Biosciences, where I'm, uh, I'm the founder and the CTO of that company. Um, and I want to put this, di this disclaimer up here. You can read that, but my disclaimer today is that today I'm here on behalf of uh, a company called Precisome in Eugene, Oregon. This is going to serve as kind of uh, the, the debut for the ASHE audience for what we're doing there. I think it's something very exciting. Uh, I, think, I think you'd agree that, that PacBio made a big difference, but I think this is going to make just as big a difference and maybe bigger. And I, and I hope that at the end of this talk that you'll understand why. So just a, a, a quick piece of context. This is a paper that came out, uh, there, there's a pair of them actually, uh, that came out earlier this year on the human leukocyte antigen uh, site using Pacific Biosciences sequencing and I was bowled over by the result that they got when they, they look at who gets a correct call and who does not get a correct call on the survivability for a bone marrow transplantation. It's about a factor of two. So when you know what you're looking for, accuracy really matters and this is huge. I mean, this is a factor of two almost in survivability. But this is more the exception than the rule. More often, if we look at a, a disorder like STXBP1, it's a very different, situ very different situation. Patients show up, they, they are, they're not well, they'll find a mutation in a gene, maybe in multiple genes, maybe there'd be 11 or so, and you don't necessarily know whether it's pathogenic or benign. And this is a serious issue. It might be a rare disease. It's, it's around one in 100,000 patients. But for the people who suffer from this disease, it's the burden, the disease burden is huge. There's, they're refractory to most drugs. There really aren't any drugs that are targeting this. Some are treated with anti-epileptic drugs, and this is uh, uh, providing some relief. But it has a, a broad array of presentations from developmental delay, uh, autism, uh, uh, sometimes epilepsy. And there's really no good way to, to uh, uh, diagnose and treat this. There's ClinVar, but in ClinVar, you'll see the situation is not great. This is just overall, looking across all diseases, that there's a, a pretty big chunk of annotations of, of benign, a big chunk that are pathogenic. But by far, the largest slice of that is stuff where people say, I don't really know. They're variants of uncertain significance. This is the primary reason why the diagnostic yield of clinical genetics is not as high as it could be. And it's, a, it's a, an amazingly important issue. It's not enough to know what the base is in the genome. You have to have the functional annotation as well. And by the way, this is not just um, uh, uh, a situation that is the result of not yet having enough study. The situation in, in genes like TP53 or BRCA1 and 2 isn't that different. So this is not a problem, uh, a frontier problem. This is a fundamental problem. So, so for me, the, the beginnings of this for me came uh, in a, a startup company in Eugene, Oregon called Nema Metrics. Now uh, I'm going to introduce it as Precisome for reasons that you'll see a little bit uh, later on. In fact, coincidentally, well, maybe not so coincidentally, right next to the Thermo Fisher campus uh, um, there in Eugene, Oregon. And that company uh, works with this guy. This is the C. elegans. A model organism, you know, C. elegans for me before uh, I uh, started this process uh, was always in the back of my mind as being important in what we know about biology. In fact, uh, when you think about it, it's it's everywhere. Like we had Nobel prizes in uh, uh, two of them in the in the last decade alone. You had Fire, Mello, uh, Brenner, uh, touching all kinds of uh, bi biological phenomena such as development, RNAi, apoptosis, all elucidated using. Uh, uh, C. elegans. In fact, if this guy had fingers, his fingerprints would be on almost every aspect of human biology. So that success in the early 2000s led to most pharma companies spinning up uh, model organism study groups, Drosophila, zebrafish, and uh, C. elegans. But most of them backed away from that again. And the reason was they cited poor portability to human studies. And I'm going to give you a spoiler for what the end of the talk is, is that I think it's time to revisit that. Technology is a rising tide that can make an old idea that didn't work, work again. And I hope to convince you that it's time to revisit this, and I'll, uh, uh, and I'll show you why. So this company, Nema Metrics, was a leader in phenotyping uh, technologies and consumables, uh, uh, electrophysiology, uh, uh, kits that include media. There, there's a, a range of products and services there that, where you can create a new genotype in either a zebrafish or C. elegans. You can do phenotyping services like a contract, a, a CRO for C. elegans, uh, where we can do 
um, phenotyping for you. And, uh, and, and I just want to touch on some of the issues that make this thing new again. We have, compared to 20 years ago, much better ability to make precise genetic modifications using CRISPR technology and others where we can make uh, complete knockouts, point mutations, base pair specific breakpoints on large deletions. We can use uh, uh, controllable alleles where you can do temporal modification of expression uh, as well as using uh, extra, chromosomal, extra chromosomal arrays and Mosky cassettes to be able to conveniently swap things out. Uh, on the phenotyping front, I mentioned the electrophysiology already, but you have locomotion, you have uh, um, longevity and all of the things that go with it. So this is a rich environment here in this company to be able to look at what we could do again with the, uh, uh, the C. elegans nematode as a model. I just want to show this because this is really cool stuff. Uh, I, my background in graduate school uh, was in, in micro and nanofluidics. So this is a, a, a fantastic uh, a application of microfluidics where you, you trap the nematode in a microfluidic channel. You can then uh, uh, use the software package to, to track the electrophysiological activity associated with that pumping that's in the, the pharynx of the uh, the worm as it eats. And this is a very, very rich data stream, and I'm going to talk later about that in the context of, well, actually later is right now. So, <laughs> um, so now, what, what's the reason why we want to come and look at this again? Things that we didn't have in the 2000s, CRISPR for precise editing, the concept of deep phenotyping. So instead of looking for a phenocopy where people say, well, if we're going to look at an anxiety medication, we need to have, we need to be able to tell whether the worms are anxious or not anxious. And that's, a, that's an interesting approach. But we can also think of these worms as very complex biosensors. Systems biology connects the phenotype, the behavior of the worm, intric intricately to the entire network of protein regulation. So instead of trying to think of a phenocopy, let's start thinking about phenologs, where we're going to look at a large number of parameters, put each individual worm into a high dimensional space, and then use machine learning algorithms to try to associate that with the thing that we care about. That's the big idea here. And I'm gonna, and, and then the, the goal, that's the technology. And then the goal is to do functional annotation of unknown uh, uh, variants of uncertain significance uh, in the genome. And I'm gonna tell you about what we've done. So I'm about uh, six months into this project. And so this is very much a work in, pro uh, in progress. And I hope that you'll be uh, as inspired as I am by the results that we've had so far. But you'll, you'll also see that we have a long way to go. So we, we created this new brand, Precisome, in order to pursue this opportunity. So Nemometrics, the company that makes the, uh, uh, the, the phenotyping tools and services, continues to exist. Uh, but what I'm talking to you about today is Precisome, the, the segment which is going after the, the functional annotation of the human genome. So the first thing is we don't, we don't look at the nematode gene we humanize the entire, the entire uh, uh, protein that we're looking at. That means amino acid for amino acid identical with the one that is uh, in a human being. And miraculously, a uh, very large fraction of the time, the nematode, even though it's about 600 million years diverged from human, just picks up this thing and says, okay, I, I can use this. And you get rescue of function. So that gives us the opportunity to say, well, let's, let's humanize that locus. We're then gonna put in a mutation that we find in a human being, we're gonna put it into the worm and then study it. Does it look more like a pathogenic mutation or does it look more like a benign mutation in that multidimensional space? And I'm gonna use STXBP1, that, that disease condition that I mentioned at the beginning, and the outline is here. First, we're gonna humanize it. We're gonna select clinical variants for our, our um, uh, test set. We're gonna do the deep phenotyping, then do some multivariate analysis and machine learning, and then uh, at the end, I'm just going to mention what we can do with the drug response. So this is the, the uh, swap of the STX BP1. I'm using as the rescue of function electrophysiology, that pumping rate, that if you knock out the STX BP1 entirely, they almost don't pump at all. And if you put in the human gene, it restores it basically to its, its prior level. So this is a pretty amazing result to me. We've given it a human uh, uh, syntaxin binding protein. And the synapses just say, okay, fine, I'll use it. Now we're gonna, uh, we're gonna choose some mutations. For this, we, this, this is a panel of 12. We have five pathogenic, five benign. There's one variant of uncertain significance in there for good measure. And then in blue is the humanized baseline. That's the reference sequence. So it would be fair to treat that as a benign because of course, you know, the reference we hope is benign or where would we all be? 
So we, we go through the process very carefully uh, because we have uh, an ongoing pipeline of uh, customer service, we have to be very careful that we get the uh, confirmation of the insert. We always work with homozygous self-crosses. We do DNA sequence ver uh, verification as well as protein translation ver verification. But the reason why I'm here today is because we use qPCR. And the reason we do that is because we want to be sure that whatever results that we're seeing are because of the amino acid sequence of the protein we put in and not because of the expression level. We want to make sure that the protein is expressed that it's in the relevant tissues and it's in the relevant life stage where we're going to make our measurements. So the, I, I wish I had more time to go over this, but I have a lot to tell you. So I'm just going to tell you two points here. The first is we're using Thermo Fisher's Quant, uh, Quant Studio 6 Pro. And the second thing, and this, this is actually kind of vexing because I, uh, I, in my, my other job, I'm kind of a competitor to Thermo. Thermo is vexingly good at managing the customer experience and we are able to stay completely inside the thermo suite from beginning to end. And they do such a great job of dovetailing, it really makes things easier. So we're staying inside the thermo uh, product line from start to end. I'm going to show you how we chose our controls, uh, a little bit about primer design so that you can interpret the data later. We tested dynamic range. We looked at the duplex independence because we wanted to make sure that we weren't going to be seeing interference when we're doing our multiplex PCR. And then I'll show you what the results were for these worms that we made. There were some papers out there for C. elegans for what would be good housekeeping proteins that we could use as our reference, uh, but there was a little bit of disagreement between the, the references that are available. So we decided we would do that all over again, and we, um, we identified three proteins. The, the number one most informative one, PMP3, uh, was in, in agreement with the other two papers, so no surprise there, but we chose three genes to use as our comparator, and after three, we didn't see any improvement in the uh, expression stability that we were able to observe, so we, we stopped with these three. Uh, those of you that use Thermo tools will recognize this is not the Thermo software suite. We didn't have our Quant, uh, Quant Studio 6 Pro when we did this, and it's unfortunate because one of the great features of the, the 6 Pro is that you can actually combine your first real run with the process of doing your uh, housekeeping gene selection. So this it would have saved us about a week of effort if we'd had the, uh, uh, the 6 Pro when we did this. So the, the other thing we use is we, we make good use of the bioinformatic pipeline that Thermo provides. Uh, it's super convenient. We, we just highlight target, we, we upload our sequence, highlight target area, uh, areas, and then uh, uh, Thermo's pipeline will automatically design primers that give us guaranteed duplex independence and in the uh, um, similarity of, of TM. So that's super useful. And then the last point I want to make is when, when we're looking at our gene, we want to be able to quantify whether it's the human gene, the native background, the, the C. elegans gene, or if we've knocked it out. So it's just important to mention that we have our primers positioned inside the UTR, a part that is not knocked out, so that no matter what we're looking at, whether it's human, nematode, or gone, we can still get the expression level. So if I show you expression levels of knockout, it really means how often are we seeing that UTR. We checked the, the dynamic range. We, we went over seven log orders, and it's, it's beautifully uh, uh, linear and consistent. We ended up selecting a total input of 250 nanograms uh, of total RNA, which we can get from about 100 worms. Another thing we wanted to look at is the duplex independence. So for that, we did a, a, a spike in study where we took two proteins, two uh, transcripts, and we spiked them in where one of them was held at the same level, and the other we changed over a little bit more than two orders of magnitude in concentration. And you can see the results, this red curve, this is, this, this is the whole family of red curves, uh, in fact, against a bunch of other transcripts, and in no case were we ever able to budge what we were measuring for that reference uh, uh, based on the, what, what its partner was, its roommate in the duplex reaction. We do quadplex as well, but right now we don't have the throughput demands to need to go to quad, so we're mostly using only duplex. This is a, a picture of me pretending to use the instrument. I'm, uh, I'm actually famous for all of my photos of me pretending to do various things. Uh, but in all seriousness, it's a, it's a very simple uh, instrument to use. This is my 10-year-old daughter who actually was uh, uh, using the instrument, you know, uh, changing the plates around. She really got a kick out of the face recognition uh, so that she could turn the machine on without having to use her hands. And uh, um, she really got a kick out of that. But in reality, these are the three people, uh, employees at Nemo Metrics that I want to acknowledge. Uh, um, we have Jason Carrier 
and um, uh, Tanner, I, my name server is like almost completely broken. Tanner Fustel and Martin, what's her first name? Brittany Martin are the three uh, staff members that did all the work that you're, you're about to see. So we did a, a bunch of both biological and technical replicates. Each bar you see here is three separate wells in the, in the qPCR plate, and each, um, uh, each column is a separate biological replicate. Uh, we, we wanted to look at operator to operator independence, and the, the, the 6 Pro really did a great job there. These are color-coded by operator. It's over a 1.5 month period. Uh, each of these four groups is a different protein, and you can see that the consistency is very good. These are the raw CQ values. It didn't make sense to uh, take a ratio at this level because these are the housekeeping genes that we're comparing with. Uh, the, the results turned out interestingly. So the, this variability that you see is real. We know from looking at the, um, the replicates that some of these differences are real. So that, that's intriguing and something that we want to follow up on. However, we're getting pretty consistent about, on average, 75% of what the native background expression is. So that's good enough. We know that that's biologically useful to the organism. And most importantly, there's no systematic difference between the benigns and the pathogenics. If there had been, we wouldn't be able to conclude that we were looking at differences from the amino acid sequence. And that's the key. So that brings us to the, the cool part, the, uh, this, the, the qPCR is very cool, but what, we, what it helped us to do is this. We did the deep phenotyping. We have uh, lots of uh, assays we can do, you know, gene expression, fecundity, longevity, but we chose electrophysiology and motion for this particular test. We gathered something like 33 parameters out of that heartbeat trace that I showed you earlier on and, and tracked them over hundreds of individual worms. And we can put that, we can, we can synopsize that by doing a principal component analysis and take a look at where those worms uh, show up. Here they're color coded by their genotype and you can see that they are segregating, that those different mutations are landing in different places in that multidimensional space. But we did the same thing for motion. Here we had 26 different features that include things like swimming speed, numbers of times that they uh, change direction, the, the radius of curvature of the, uh, the undulation of the worm's body. And we put those uh, also into a, a PCA. But where, where we saw the most exciting thing is when we did a linear discriminant analysis where we, we categorized them according to the, the training set, the pathogenics and the benigns. And here they are color coded. Uh, each dot here is an individual worm, and already you can see some interesting things. Like, for example, that R122X mutation is a, a premature truncation, and that one is an outlier. It's showing up out here. Let me show you the centroids of these distributions. So here they are, same color coding. Look at this guy way off on the side. There is some other uh, evidence from uh, an epilepsy excerpt, expert, Ingo Helbig, who I think presented it. Uh, at the ST STXBP1 meeting publicly earlier this year, so I can mention it, he is seeing that premature truncation shows up phenotypically, meaning in the clinical presentation, differently than the missense variants. And we're seeing that as well, that it's off that diagonal. But let, wh wh what does this mean? Let's now look at the annotation. If we look at them uh, f uh, benign versus pathogenic, and I don't know if you can see it from where you're sitting, but there's separation there. The reds, the, the pathogenics are more over here, the benign's over here. Let's look at the centroids, and this is what we get. Here are the five pathogenics. Here are the five benigns. There's the humanized. This looks like it's working. Now, we have to be careful because linear discriminant analysis kind of cheats. If you go into very high dimensional data, linear discriminant analysis can always find a way to segregate, segregate those things. So we had to check this to make sure it's real. What we did is we did a holdout test where we took 80% of the worms and used that to train the LDA. And then we used 20% of the worms that were completely naive. So that it was like they didn't even exist in the the training data, and then we took those data and used it to classify the mutations as to whether they were pathogenic or benign. And we got eight out of the 10 correct in that case. And, and also the, the, uh, the humanized also showed up as benign. So that's not bad. It's preliminary, and we need to do a lot more. We're, when we're gonna put in um, many more mutations in order to, to solidify that space. But it looks to me like this is working that we can now take a mutation that has never been seen before, we can functionally analyze it and tell whether it's pathogenic or benign. And then we can do something else. Because we have that in a worm, we can drug the worm. 
And if the drug is actually targeting the mutant protein, which a fair fraction of these drugs do, we can look at restoration of function. The, the therapeutic odyssey that epilepsy, epilepsy, <coughs> epilepsy patients go through that can sometimes be years long can now be shortened by prioritizing which drugs should be applied to which patients. So I think this is hugely significant. I'm, I, I'm not going to uh, go over all these details because I'm over time, but I just want to say being able to increase the diagnostic yield is going to help everybody in this space. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll take questions.